Greetings, and welcome to this short video series, Giants in L&D for 2021, where our focus this year is on research. Our guest, Carl Kopp, we've asked him to share with us 10 to 15 minutes on one area of research that he believes all L&D practitioners should be aware of. But before we launch into that, Carl, would you please take a minute or two to introduce yourself and your topic and share with our audience a little bit about your related background? Sure, Guy, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to, to be here. So uh, I always tell people my day job is I'm a professor of instructional technology at Bloomsburg University in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, and I teach in the graduate program of instructional design. Uh, but I really uh, got interested a number of years ago in the concept of games and gamification. So I've really been looking into that that area. And so uh, I got really excited about it. I wrote some books about uh, games and gamification. I did some, uh, at the time, lynda.com courses. Now they're LinkedIn learning courses. And I speak about and write about and consult about how do you take the concepts from games and add them into the idea of building effective instruction, not just to keep people busy, but actually to have an impact on the, the learning. So uh, my background uh, is, is uh, primarily academic, but I do a lot of practitioner work as I help people kind of take the research about games and apply them to the development of their own uh, corporate and academic um, development of instruction. Well, thank you for that. Given your expertise in games and gamification, how does that inform, affect, or support learning and development? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. So to me, learning and development is really about one of the, the things I, I laugh all the time is when I was younger, people would always say, hey, Carl, you need to practice. You need to practice to get better. And I would practice and I would get better. And then you go into a corporate environment, like no one practices. <laughs> they just like you tell them something and they magically know how to do it. Um, so one of the things that got me interested a while back was how do we find out ways to practice our skills and our ideas in meaningful ways that give us, you know, as it's called deliberate feedback, right? Feedback that makes a difference. And so one of the ways that I discovered that was through games. I was, it was still early kind of in the internet and, um, People were trying to figure out, well, we can't make this that engaging or how do we make that engaging? I'm like, well, let's, let's use games or pieces of games. And people are like, oh, we're not game developers. We're instructional designers. You can't use games. I'm like, no, no, no. I don't want to use all the game. I just want to use a piece of the game. And people are like, yeah, nah, I don't know what you mean by that. And then finally, uh, the word gamification came about. And it's kind of funny because uh, when I wrote my first book, The Gamification of Learning and Instruction, or the first book on the topic, um, the editor pushed back. He's like, what? No one knows what that word is, gamification. You can't use that word. And it was kind of funny. So I had to do all this research, like Money Magazine had an article about it, Forbes and uh, Harvard Business Review. And finally, I'm like, look, it's a real word. He's like, okay, you, you could use the word gamification. And then the other pushback that I got, which kind of surprised me, is like, well, there's no research on games. Like nobody knows if games are actually effective for learning. And the irony is, <laughs> that research literally goes back decades in terms of people researching the effectiveness of learning games. And it's always amusing to me that people think, you know, learning games are something new. Like in 2000, somebody invented learning games. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll say Oregon Trail, you know, back in the 80s or whatever. But <laughs> people like Tiagi have been doing learning games since like the late 60s. And the first learning game ever used in an organization was in the 1930s. And before that, the Prussians were using games for uh, studying military warfare. And before, before that, you know, like it goes back, I think when humans first appeared on Earth, they probably used games for some kind of, of learning. So learning games have been around for a long time. And like every 20 years, we kind of forget, I think, that learning games are out there and, and video games are like the, the revolutionary thing. So one of the things that I think from uh, instructional technology or designer perspective is understand how games immerse us in a situation and then provide us feedback. So one of the things that games do really, really well that not a lot of instruction does is it gives us typically immediate corrective feedback. 
So when you're in a game and you do something wrong, you know it immediately. That's not the right thing to do. And then you think about it. And the other cool things that games do is it makes us reflect on the situation. So a lot of uh, research out there, and in fact, my belief is that people don't learn without reflection, right? It's only an experience if you don't reflect on it. And so games actually force us oftentimes to reflect on what's happening, to make adjustments, to see if that adjustment works, and then to make more or further adjustments. And there's actually a, a large body of research, as I said, that shows games are really effective for learning. So, but they have to be administered correctly. So one of the things that we should do if we're going to use a game for learning is we first have to set up the game. You have to explain to the learners what's going to be happening in the game. You don't have to give away if there's like an aha moment, like if you've ever played uh, the MIT beer distribution game, there's an aha moment in that game, which I, no spoiler alerts here. But you set up people, like this is what you're going to be talking about. You're going to be looking at supply chain. You're going to be ordering beer. You have to know how that works. So you set up the game. The second part is actually playing the game. And the third is the debrief of the game or the military, the after action review. And that's really important for the transfer of the learning to go to the game. So I think those elements are important. Feedback and understanding how to use games in that instructional setting. Another thing that I think we should all learn from games is the art of storytelling. Now, not every game has a story, but games use story to propel us through the experience. And I think that's really important. The other thing that games do really well, and there's lots of people working on stories, so I'm not going to go into too much depth on that. But the other thing that I think is really important when we think about games for learning, we look at stories and we look at feedback, also think about challenges. So one of the things that happens in every learning situation, and uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi talks about flow. And what happens, I think a lot of people forget, is that learning, when we start to learn things, once we get it, we become bored with it. Hey, I've already got it. I'm good. I don't need to go any further. The problem is, as an instructor or as someone designing a learning, we need to make it progressively more difficult. And games do that really well. They add levels or they add challenges. Once you've challenged, once you've mastered something, the game ups the challenge. And now I've got you know faster bad guys or I've got more obstacles I have to uh, overcome and those kind of things. So that's really important. And it, and it goes back a long way. Like if you think about Seymour Papert, right? And he talks about every maker of video games knows something that the makers of curriculum don't and don't seem to understand. He said that you'll never see a video game being advertised as easy, right? Kids don't like school. will tell you it's not because it's too hard. They'll tell you because it's boring. And I think a lot of training that we design is actually boring. We like, oh, we have to cover the basics. We have to make sure everybody knows it. Well, adult learners only learn best when they know they don't know something. So what I think we should do as designers of instruction is alert the learners that they don't know something. Well, how do you do that without telling them, hey, you don't know this? You put them in a game situation and have them solve the problem or figure out the situation and then the learners go, ooh, I, I don't know this. Okay, I've got to I've got to figure this out. So one of the really interesting things that that I've done one time. This is a live event, but we looked at uh, training on how to conduct an internal investigation, and this is for a company that worked for the DoD. And apparently, there's a lot of <laughs> bad news is there's a lot of internal investigations. So uh, the typical class was put together by uh, well-intentioned subject matter experts who are all lawyers, and it was the typical. Here's our learning objectives, here's the terminology, here's the forms, here's how you fill out the forms, and here's a role play. And so people knew how to do it, but they didn't know, they know about it, but they didn't know how to do it. So we changed that completely on its head. People came in and we said, hey, you uh, have just been approached by a fellow employee who's accused your boss of embezzling $10,000. What do you do? And so the group looked around and goes, yeah, what do we do? And they were waiting for the instructor like to tell them something. And the instructor was like, no, you, what would you do? And they're like, well, uh, what's the company policy? Yeah. And they all went to the computer, looked up the company policy and found out and goes, oh, we need to interview some people. Okay. Well, I just happen to have the uh, coworker here. You can interview. And we kind of set the whole thing up. So at the end, they actually had done the entire investigation. So rather than learning about doing an investigation, they actually did the investigation. And I think designers of instruction, um, even if you don't make it into a game, need to have that sense of immersion 
that sense of feedback. Now, the beauty of doing it in a safe environment is if you go off in the wrong direction, the facilitator or the uh, online um, instruction can say, hey, wait a minute, that, that's not right. Go in this direction. Don't waste too much time. You know, we could learn everything through experiential learning, but it would take forever and we'd be reproducing the wheel every time. But we have to have some of that freedom of movement. And if you think of video games, for example, uh, the sandbox, like, you know, Minecraft gives you some freedom of movement of to do things, but also has some rules that you have to follow to get to where you want to go. Even, you know, a wide open world like Red Dead Redemption or Grand Theft Auto have rules that you've got to follow. Not so much a Grand Theft Auto, but, you know, uh, the rules that you need to follow in physics and those kind of things. So games can help you do that. So I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from games. I've even done some research where we found that uh, playing a small game for a short period of time and then being introduced to a question and then playing another small game focuses the learner almost more on that question or that content. Now, there's a lot that we still have to learn about games. One of the things about research uh, and games that's frustrating to me is research works well when we isolate one variable and you keep every other variable the same and then you can make you know some generalizations but in a game there's a lot going on it's the gestalt of the game i think that actually teaches us something so to try to break that part and say oh the game's just the sum of its parts it's not it's the greater than the sum of its parts so we really have to think about that from a, from a research perspective but we know things like curiosity, we know things like mystery, intrigue, draw people into games and can draw them into learning as well. So as a learning professional, uh, my advice is always to have people go play games, figure out what you like about a game, what's engaging about a game, use those elements in the design of your instruction. You don't have to create a full force Call of Duty, uh, but you can beg and borrow and steal some of the ideas about immersion, feedback and story and um, uh, leveling up and challenge that will make your instruction more purposeful. And when you do that, when you focus your instruction using those elements, but on the outcome that's desired, the performance, the practice that you want somebody to do, uh, you can go a long, long way. So that's why I think everyone in our field should study and practice gamification and instructional game design. Carl, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today and for your contributions to the profession. Have a great day. Thanks, Guy.